I was thinking about, Lord, what, which portrait? I was trying to do a portrait on a Redeemer, and I'm sure that study will come out later. I was studying that, and then God just seemed to lead me to Peter. You know, so we're going to take a look at Peter. First Peter, as he paints a picture of Jesus Christ. I heard Roy Thompson preach a sermon called Portraits of Jesus in 1 John. And he pulled out five portraits of Jesus out of the book of 1 John and preached it one sermon. Excellent sermon. That's what gave me the thought of portraits of Jesus Christ. How many of you have walked with the Lord today? Did you walk with the Lord today? I heard another sermon about walking with the Lord. And it says, Enoch walked with the Lord 350 years. Surely you could do it for a day. Right? There was another man that said he walked with the Lord. I don't remember who it was. Walked with the Lord some 900 years. I think it was Noah. <laughs> he walked with the Lord all of his life. He lived 950 years or 930 years. One of those two. 950, I think. He walked with the Lord 950 years. Are you walking with God today? Are you walking with the Lord? Did you spend most of the day considering Him? You talk with Him throughout the day about everything you're doing and what you're doing. If it is, then when you come to church, it's not really a change in your mindset, is it? You just come to church and you sing some praises to the Lord, and, and you probably already sang a praise or two to God today with some of your own words, and you, know, you read your scriptures, and uh, you know you praise the Lord for something good that you saw, and uh, you're working on something and ask for the Lord's help. Today when I was working on something, it didn't work out, and Elvin said, did you pray, for it? Did you pray about it? <laughs> did you ask the Lord? No, I said, well, no, yeah, yeah, I did, I did, that was the other day. So, uh, um, walking with God, if you did. Now, if you come to church, and there's a, there's a shift in your mind, you know, because you got to now worship God, it's, time, it's God time, then, uh, then you're not walking with the Lord. You've gotten distracted, you've gotten off the course, you know, and that happens, something that happens to you sometimes, you know, there's something busy, you're working all day, your mind's on something else all day, and you come in, and it's time to praise him, pray, and you're trying to use the music to get yourself into worship mode, into thinking about God mode, into, and, and that's not how it's supposed to be. Well, you know, we use the music to prepare us for the sermon, well, that's not in the Bible, the Bible, you don't need any preparation for preaching, As a matter of fact, it's the other way around, preaching prepares you for singing. Preaching is what God's chosen to say, if not singing. Not to, we, we don't need to get our hearts ready for the sermon, right? We're just walking with God. And when you sit down and, and there's a sermon, it might be on your radio during the day, it might be something you stuck in at a certain time, and you're listening to a little bit of preaching. I had a chance today for about 20 minutes. to. I was in my office after I finally found a mouse that works and uh, got one to work and turned it on and was able to listen to uh, two different 20-minute Sessions, one on counseling, one on something else, about and preaching. I just sat there and enjoyed it for a little while. Then, then I clicked over to a song from uh, West Coast Baptist College, and man, was it beautiful singing. And uh, it did my heart good. That's 20, you know, 25, 30, 40 minutes. Had a couple free time. Just walking with the Lord. My thoughts went on my mind today. Now you're walking with the Lord. I hope you are. I hope you are. Look at Peter. Peter points up, points, paints. Peter paints a portrait of Jesus Christ as what well we know if you're a Bible scholar and I know you're one of those Bible thumpers I know you are you know that Peter first Peter is about what suffering Matt says does anybody agree Joe agrees anybody else Eli's sleeping <laughs> he just turned out right you Princess agrees. You better agree, right? She, yeah, he's always right. He's your husband, almost. And uh, Rick agrees, I think. He's just waving to me. <laughs> okay, he agrees. Yeah, it's about suffering, right? It's a treaty on suffering. Now, how many know, what did Peter think about suffering earlier in the Gospels? Matthew says he didn't think about it. No, <laughs> he didn't like it. He didn't understand it. Somebody tell me, what did he think? How do you know he didn't understand suffering? Right? He was going to fight for Jesus Christ, right? What, what did he say to Jesus in Matthew chapter 16? Jesus said to him, get thee, 18, 18, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest the things that be of man, for thou art offense to me, for thou savorest things that be of man, not of God. Why did he say that to Peter? 
When was Peter backing up Satan? What did Peter say before then? Jesus began to tell them about how he would suffer at the hands of the Gentiles and that, that he would be crucified. And, and what did Peter say? Not so, Lord, far be it from thee. Suffering, no, no, we're not supposed to suffer. Peter was like most modern-day Christians and just didn't get suffering as part of God's plan. So later, when Peter saw other Christians suffering, Peter got it. He finally started to understand suffering years later. So he sat down with the apostolic pen inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he wrote to suffering Christians. Most of the time when you're studying 1 Peter, it's studying in light of helping those Christians that are suffering. Now, we're not looking at that tonight. We're looking at the other side. How do you help people who are suffering? How? Well, this is how he does it. He paints the portrait of the suffering servant, Jesus Christ. He paints the portrait of the suffering servant. Let me show you how he does it. All right. Look at 1 Peter, chapter number 1. And we begin to read, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Aren't you glad you don't live there? Bradford's easier to say. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, through the sanctification of the Spirit, to the obedience of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Notice right in the introduction here, in verse number 2, he mentions the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. Now what comes to your mind? <laughs> Leah says, nothing's coming to my mind. Leah has a headache tonight. She's suffering, but she's in church anyhow. God bless you. Um, the blood of Jesus Christ. Notice he brings out the blood. Now, if I were to talk about my blood, it, it's kind of odd, huh? But if, but if you saw me bleed and die, you know, and the blood was shed on the ground and somebody talked about my blood there, you know, it brings to memory the blood. When you think about the blood of Jesus Christ, immediately we go to the cross. You know, that's, that's where, and did Jesus ever bleed at any other time in his life? We have no idea, do we? I mean, did he ever cut himself working as a kid? Did he ever have any any reasons? Maybe somebody else cut him earlier in life. Did he ever walk through some briars and get scratched? You know, um, uh, you know, did he? We don't know. Was the, was the blood coming out of his body when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Um, suffering, 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 right? But when you think of the blood, you can start at the garden. You can go right through the crucifixion. It's that last night of Jesus Christ, the blood. Notice how he brings this up. The first picture of Jesus seen in his, his epistle, the blood of Jesus Christ. It's immediately going to bring to your mind something. He bled. Look at verse 3. Blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to the abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He died. He bled. He died. The first thing Peter begins to talk to you about when he's writing the letter to the person that's suffering, he's just writing to you and he wants to tell you first about how Jesus bled and how Jesus died. Jesus will put it this way, the servant's not greater than his master. If they hated me, they'll hate you. If they call me Beelzebub, what are they going to say to you? Right? Jesus Christ, our Master, our Lord, the one we serve, suffered, bled, died, rose again. This process that we see in here, he, he emphasizes this. We're following the one that suffered. Today, I did not feel like studying my Bible to prepare for tonight. I didn't want to do it. Why not? Lazy, for the most part. You, know, you just don't feel like studying right now. But you got to anyway. Oh, how we suffer so much, right? What helps you get over struggling to do what you don't want to do? The blood of Jesus Christ. He who died. Jesus Christ, he resurrection from the dead. Now remember who we follow. If he can die for me, I can read my Bible for him. 
If he can die for me, I can go to church for him. If he can die for me, and this is how Peter begins. Look at verse 11. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified before the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. There's a secondary theme in Peter about the following glory. But notice how he mentions there the sufferings, he puts it in plural, of Christ. Suffering of Christ. Suffering of Christ. He's putting across a constant message. A constant message. It's going to come out of 1 Peter Every chapter, every way through, a constant message of the suffering of Jesus Christ. The suffering. When we're talking to the Lord, we're talking to one that suffered. And this is a reminder, a reminder. Look at verse 19. You know this, we're not bought by, you know, vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers. Verse 18, but verse 19 goes, but with the precious blood of Jesus of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So here we have this reminder, the blood of Jesus Christ. We go back to verse 11, the sufferings of Jesus Christ. We go back to verse 3, the death of Jesus Christ. We go back to verse 2, the blood of Jesus Christ. Notice how this repeated theme rises again, the the suffering of Jesus Christ. Rises again, his death. Rises, his blood. Rises. All through Peter, he keeps bringing to the forefront, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking to Jesus, the suffering servant of God. The suffering servant of God. This comes up over and over and over. Look at verse 19 of chapter 2. But with the precious blood of Christ. I'm sorry, we already looked at that one. Verse number 21. By uh, Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. Notice there. The right resurrection again. The, from the dead. Listen. If you die... It probably didn't go well, right? If I'm heading to Walmart and I die on the way, then I probably wasn't in my plan, was it? Um, I didn't make it back. I died. Uh, That's usually not a happy ending, right? And he died. Um, Headed to Walmart, made sure I had my card, forgot my mask, turned around, headed back, and he died. And uh, that's not a happy ending, is it? Uh, the, the, the reminding of the death. He's going to die. He's going to die. He's going to die. Um, uh, he died. He died. He bled. He bled. He di- I'm not going to die. He died. He bled. He died. He bled. He died. He suffered. Wait a minute. Notice what he's doing. Now, if you read this, this, this portion, there's many parts that pertain to us. Let this mind be, or gird up the loins of your mind, and and all these things that tell us about ourselves in lieu of our own suffering, okay? Uh, Gird yourselves with the same mind. He's talking about our suffering, but to to help us through suffering, what's he going to do? He paints a picture of the Lord. Now, one of the pictures is glory, but the other picture will always be the suffering of Christ. Uh, 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 Chapter 2, verse 4. The sufferings of Christ. It says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men. Now this is this is that eye of, of Jesus Christ who's disallowed of men. And another place that, that'll be told rejected. The stone that was rejected. Disallowed. Not accepted. This you know, it's a tough thing to see, to read, but but he wasn't received, okay? And that's a tough thing to read. Uh, But notice it brings again Christ's position. He bled, he died. He suffered. He bled, he died. He was rejected. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 21. It says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us. Here again, he disallowed, now suffered. Notice this repeated theme, the picture of Jesus Christ. He's the suffering one. He came and suffered for us. He suffered. That's a great verse, by the way. You should have circle start, underline, and highlight it. Um, he suffered for us. But it says, you know, that first part's written to us. Here too are you called. You're not called to glory. You're not called to pleasantness. What are you called to? To suffer. Right? And uh, Oh, by the way, it starts. the next subject is wives. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, Andrea, you might want to understand that, right? You're free from that right now, right? And uh, uh, after Saturday, likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband. But notice that's that's in the context of suffering, <laughs> right? How many wives would, would give some you know counsel to Andrea, right? There's going to be some suffering and uh, at the hands of your husband. Yes, absolutely. And uh, but notice the context. It says uh, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Christ suffered for us. Christ suffered for us. Look at verse 24. You're in chapter two, verse 24. Who in his own flesh bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Notice, brings up the tree, which is the cross, his own body bearing our sins. Again, the suffering Jesus Christ. When you're going through struggling, when you're going through anything, it's the looking to the Lord. That's your help. That's your strength. You're looking to the Lord. He's suffering. Look to his suffering. You say, well, what if you suffer just as much as him? Well, then you joined him. What if you're suffering as somebody who tortured for their faith? Then you're joining him. Paul says, I fill up the sufferings left behind of Christ. You can suffer too, and you may suffer greatly. You've joined him. Whereas he suffered in this world. Suffering, suffering. Look at uh, chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. They weren't his sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Oh, by the way, that's in context of wives suffering for your husbands, husbands suffering for your wives. Why? To bring them to God. That's how you bring somebody to God, is you suffer for their sin. For Christ hath also suffered for sins. Notice the, here it is again, back up to the surface. Christ suffered. Christ bled. Christ died. Christ was disallowed. This, this idea of suffering, Suffering is a constant theme brought up over and over and over. Look at chapter 4, verse 13. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Now this is a great verse. Why? Because it talks about the end of suffering. That when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Notice that. Partakers of Christ's suffering. Christ suffered. We're going to suffer. Look at verse 14. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, right? There's, see, everything is applicable to the sufferer. If you're suffering, if you're struggling, if you're having a hard time, it's the looking to Jesus, the author and finish for our faith. It's the looking to Jesus, the suffering servant, that strengthens the sufferer. And I know you're talking to this young crowd up here. You know, they don't know what suffering is yet, right? <laughs> they get a little older, they're learning what suffering is, when daily things hurt. But you know there's young people suffering too. I hear stories of kids and they're suffering. What do you do for somebody that's suffering? Point them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. What, is, what does the man do when he is inspired by God to write about suffering? And he's seeing people suffer. And he wants to strengthen them. What's he do? He writes to them about the suffering Jesus. And then he applies it to them. This is the application. This is how you handle suffering. First, let me tell you about his suffering. Let me tell you about his suffering. Now I'll tell you about yourself. Now let me tell you about his suffering. Now I'll go back to you. Let me tell you about his suffering. Now we'll go back to you. Let me tell you about... Here's what he doesn't do. Well, yeah, I hurt too. He doesn't relate to them as a man to man. He relates to them by man to God, man to Christ. That's how he relates to them. This, this is good pastoral stuff. By taking somebody and turning them to Christ. You notice that's, that's what we're supposed to do? You know, if, if you just relate to somebody. Now, ladies, I don't want to pick on ladies, but I like to. They do this a lot. My wife does this all the time. You know, she, I'll be telling her something, and she'll cut me off and tell me about how she experienced something similar. 
you know, and I'm a guy, so I don't always get the connection. <laughs> you know? But she does that all the time. Well, what is she doing? She's trying to relate. And women are really good at this. They relate. And if you listen to two women talk, when they relate to one another, that's when they've decided they've communicated. And, you know, and that's how women do it. That's, that's how they do it. It's wonderful. It's who they are. It's how they do it. So relating one to another is what they do. We um, want to relate people to Christ. What do you need, brother? You need Andrea? Matthew? Oh, oh, the, the, the signing sheet. Okay, you're looking for the signing sheet. Um, the, if you wanted us to pray for you tonight, you better get, get busy because we're about to start praying. It's just about five minutes. So we've got, um, we take people and we relay them to Christ. We relay. This is why it's so important. You're in your Bible. This is why it's so important. You get to know your Bible. You're listening to preaching. You're walking with God. So that when somebody's doing something, we relate them to Christ. And this is what Peter does in a beautiful way. Look at chapter uh, um, 5, verse number 1. He says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He constantly goes into this idea of suffering is here and now. But he also points to the return of Christ, what God did for Christ after suffering. He points to the end of suffering, what it comes to. What does it turn? It's on. Yep. Batteries. Nope. Light, red light's on. The part is, this, is what Peter relates to. There you go. Was it not plugged in? Yeah, wasn't plugged in. So I witnessed the suffering of Christ, but then he always goes to what follows. Suffering is going to end one day, and it ends in glory. So when we suffer for Jesus Christ, notice what he says to the pastors in verse number uh, um, 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that faith. Notice, he's going into the appearance of Jesus Christ. When Jesus appears. Look at chapter 1, verse 7. What happened after Christ died? He rose from the dead. What, what happened after he bled? He was honored by God. In verse number, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found to the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Look at uh, verse 21. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. Notice, it, it didn't end at suffering. Suffering does come to an end, but the glory that follows, that's not the end of the story. So he takes us to the glory, and he constantly brings us to that glory afterwards. Look at chapter 3, verse 27. But notice, he's talking about the coming of Jesus Christ and what God did for Jesus Christ. Um, chapter 3, verse 27. Find that? You're a miracle worker. Chapter 3, verse 22. Look at Jesus, who is gone into heaven. My Bible says above it, please come back soon. <laughs> no, he's gone. Hey, that's a sad verse, friends. Jesus is gone. Did you know that? But you know, my dad's gone too, and that's sad. And I could say to my kids, someday your dad will be gone. But you can also use that same phrase, he's gone into heaven. Now, that's not so bad, is it? Who has gone into heaven is at the right hand of God. So Jesus has gone into heaven. Notice the end. He went to heaven. He went to heaven. So what we have here is look to Jesus. Look at what he suffered. You're going to suffer too. And let this mind, gird up the loins of your mind with suffering by looking to Jesus and, and meditate on his sufferings and see how he suffered and, and recognize that strengthens us in our suffering. But then also look at what God did for Jesus after the suffering. He raised him from the dead. He didn't leave him dead. He received him and gave him glory. And he went to heaven where there's no more suffering. And then he talks about our, our crown, our glory, and then what we get when we get to heaven. So suffering is done by two things, looking to Jesus, what, how he suffered and was glorified. Now we're going to suffer and we'll receive glory. Notice there's no relationship here. Well, yeah, I hurt too. That's not how a Christian does it. That's not edification. Sometimes it's nice to, you know, 
tell somebody, well, you know, but the trouble is it doesn't always relate. You know, yeah, I broke my finger, and I know that broken leg hurts. Your broken finger did not hurt like somebody's broken femur, right? It's not, I broke a bone once, yeah, wow, it was terrible, you know? And they had a spiral fracture on their femur, you know? Not the same thing, all right? Um, uh, I, I've broken a rib, but let me tell you, that, that's, that hurts. That, that's awful, that's horrible. And I broke a finger, it's not the same. Um, a lot of times our relations don't work, it's hard to help somebody, you know, and uh, try to console them. What's the consolation that we give people? What is edification? Build them up spiritually. How? Point them to Jesus. You know, the Bible says we're going to suffer for, as Christians like Jesus Christ. You know that Jesus suffered when he was on earth? But you know what happened at the end of his suffering? God glorified him. After he was, he was, he was crucified, he was resurrected. We suffer in the name of the Lord Jesus. And this is what we do. We look to the end. Look at chapter 5, verse number 4. Oh, we already read that. Um, the crown of glory. Uh, and I think we read the verses I want to sh look at tonight. What am I getting at here? What is the picture here? What's the purpose of the portraits of Jesus Christ? Well, for one, we want to just study the Lord. You may not have thought of a picture of Jesus all day today. What is the portrait of Jesus Christ? What's the purpose of it? Why? Why? Well, you want to be able to point somebody to Jesus in such a way that it relates to them. I don't want to point them to me. And I do that sometimes. Yeah, I've been through that. I was struggling, you know. And, and uh, um, you imagine, you know, Matthew steps up here in June, and he's going to preach for three to four weeks in a row, doesn't know when I'm coming back. That's the first time he stepped up into the church with no pastor around, and he get up to preach, right? It's kind of nervous, right? And, you know, and I want to say, well, I remember the first time I went out to preach, and I remember that first time. I know how very nervous it is, and, you know, that's not a lot of help. I'm not the same person as Matt. The circumstances were different. I was sent by my pastor to go, no, I was preaching in my home church. Both my pastors left. That's right, first time I ever preached. And I was scared, and I remember that, you know, and there's some help there. You know, it's something we're all going to face. Matt, you're going to come up here, it's going to be nervous for the first few weeks, you know, and then nobody's going to think you're nervous. They're going to say, oh, you did great, you didn't even look nervous. Inside, you were a turmoil wreck, right? And that, that's the, that how, it's, how it goes. But there's very little consolation. But if we can look to the Lord as he faced things, as he faced a public ministry, as he stood up, you know, and faced a hostile crowd, and, uh, you know, we look to Jesus. God will get you through it. The Lord's called you to preach. It's what he's called you to do. You'll love preaching one day for the Lord. There's nothing like glorifying Jesus Christ. Nothing like it publicly. Nothing like it. There's nothing like the pulpit where God has called you to. It'll be the most familiar place in your life, the most comfortable place you'll ever be. It's the place you want to spend most of the day, and if they'll listen long enough, you will. And that's The Lord will do the work. And see, you've turned somebody's heart Always to the Lord. Do you always do it? No, you fail sometimes. But this is why we look at a portrait of Jesus Christ. A portrait of Jesus Christ. Why? That, that I can turn somebody else to the Lord. I can turn somebody else to the Lord. Uh, turn people to the Lord. What we see is how does Peter help people that suffer? He doesn't relate to them. He turns them to Jesus. Look at his suffering. Look what came after. If you suffer the way God wants you to suffer, you will be glorified the way God wants to glorify you. That's what he will do. God will reward you, but you got to suffer the way the Lord told you to suffer. you got to suffer. And the chapter 2 really goes into detail about how to suffer. How to suffer. And so that's, that's just the portrait of Jesus Christ tonight. He's the suffering servant. He's the suffering servant. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll take up the prayer request. Uh, glad you could join us tonight, short and sweet tonight. Just wanted to turn your heart to the Lord a little bit. Just aid your walk with Christ. As we go and pray, we're just walking with Christ. As you go home tonight, walk with the Lord. We're just walking with God. And I just helped you think a little bit about, he's a sufferer. He's a sufferer. Father, thank you, Lord, for uh, your goodness to us, God. Thank you for sending the Lord Jesus Christ to suffer with us. Thank you, Lord. Uh, he suffered for us. He suffered with us. And he still, Lord, uh, can aid us as we're suffering. He understands. And God, I pray now that we are, our hearts would be turned to the Lord. And God, we'd be enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit to turn others' hearts to the Lord. It's my desire tonight to take just... <clears throat> A few people, a few hearts, a few souls who, who know you and love you and, and aid their walk with you. 
That's all I am, Lord, is just an aid. Thank you, God. Thank you. Now, would you bless as we come to pray in Jesus' name? Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you.